Welcome to Saks Realty's Tuesday Night Podcast, where we talk about anything and everything real estate. Each week, we deliver expert information, enabling you to make better informed decisions while keeping more money in your pocket. If you're interested in real estate, this is your show. Guys, welcome to our Tuesday Night Podcast. And man, I am so excited for multiple reasons tonight. Number one, our guest, John Rubino. You guys are going to love him. He completely blew up our channel a couple of weeks ago. We posted a video with John on Saturday. If you guys haven't checked it out, I encourage you to do that. Uh, but <laughs> oh, I'm in my new studio that I've been talking about for a long time. And, you know, the, the crazy part is when you're busy running a business and doing things, trying to build these kinds of things on the side, um, you know, we're excited that we're finally in it and it's great. And I hope you guys enjoy um, what it will mean for you guys bringing you uh, a lot of great content. And there, we've got the ability for it to be very interactive. But anyway, enough of that, Melissa. Uh, Hello. As Hello, always. Todd. It's great to see you. And it's great to see you in the studio. I mean, Joe did a fantastic job. And thank you, Joe. I know you're behind the scenes, but we are so grateful for you. And it looks amazing. But yeah, there is a lot to talk about tonight. We've got the Fed announcement tomorrow. There's been in the news today talking about layoffs that are going on in the corporate world um, and our country's debt crisis. We are I don't even know if we could fit this all in in the show tonight, but John Rubino coming all the way from the West Coast. It is so nice to have you. Tell everyone who you are. Well, thanks for having me on, everybody. I'm John Rubino. I am a finance writer, former Wall Streeter, um, written five books on the economy and investing in general. Now I've got a, um, a Substack newsletter at rubino.substack.com where uh, we cover actionable stuff about what's going on in the world and there is a lot going on in the world these days yeah, and we got our uh, national debt clock that has right uh it's ticking somewhere on the screen here there we go right there guys you can see it uh john we're in major debt we're going to talk about that tonight uh but first i'd like to start off with just i mean here we are tomorrow's the big day the fed will announce what uh what their plans are for you know uh the economy the interest rate why don't you tell everybody what what are we what should we expect tomorrow with tomorrow's announcement well everybody thinks the fed's just gonna stand pat and not raise or lower interest rates and then come out with a statement that's been so focus grouped that it's guaranteed to make the stock market go go up that's uh, that's frequently how it goes you know they don't see anything uh, of import in these meetings because they know they can't. If they come out and tell the truth, that'll freak out the markets. So they have to um, they have to shade everything they say in a way that uh, keeps traders and speculators out there nice and calm. So don't expect a lot from the Fed this time around. Um, but having said that, um, for what seems like decades now, people have been predicting that the Fed and the government in general would eventually find themselves in a box where they borrowed so much money, they've created so much new currency that um, they, they are presented with a problem that has no solution because, and, and, and I think they're there right now, where if they act to lower interest rates um, by creating a lot of new currency and, uh, and generally pushing interest rates down, um, that will raise inflation again. And since we've already seen what happened in 2022 with inflation, uh, everybody's terrified of it. And that would uh, cause interest rates to spike and the dollar to tank. And so they don't want that. But on the other hand, if they were to raise rates or keep rates where they are right now, um, that will start to break all the interest rate sensitive parts of the global economy. In other words, governments will see their interest costs soar and their budgets will go out of control. And uh, people who have borrowed a lot of money in the past and who need lower interest rates in order to survive will start going bankrupt. And then we'll get something like the 1930s, a debt driven um, deflationary depression. And they know that those are the two roads that they have a choice of now. They're at this crossroads. And they, they don't really know what to do because either one leads to disaster. But that's where we are. So they have to choose something. They'll probably choose inflation because that's less of an immediate crisis. But either way, uh, because of the, the 
many mistakes we've made in the past, we're headed for one crisis or another. And it's just a really a choice right now. They have to choose which one that we're going to have. And, uh, you know, I don't envy them. They, um, they've kind of blundered into this, but most of the guys at the Fed are not horrible people. It's just that uh, they, they've come to the, uh, the place that they're in at this time with no choice but to pick a crisis and then let it play out. So that's, that's the next few years. This um, gigantic crisis of one kind or another is going to hit. And the people in charge today are going to get blamed for it. So uh, it's a mess no matter how you look at it. And uh, our question should be, how do we survive and thrive in what's coming? You think Powell's getting a lot of pressure from the White House? Oh, yeah, because it's an election year on top of everything else. So they basically have told him <clears throat> um, we cannot be raising interest rates going into a presidential election. You've got to be cutting aggressively by that time. And and if not way sooner, you know, you should be cutting interest rates right now because there's this lag between monetary policy changes and the effect on the economy. So they basically, the guys in charge right now, basically want to go into the election with a rip-roaring expansion. You know, everybody back at work, making good money, interest rates low, everybody able to borrow. That's what they want. Um, but it's not possible. And the Fed knows it's not possible. And so they're, they're in, again, and they're, in, they're in a box. And they're going to do some things, but they're probably going to, there'll be mistakes, whatever it is they do. And I don't think they're going to save their own jobs or um, the party in charge right now, because we're more than likely going to be heading into that election with some kind of a crisis going on. What do you think they're going to say about inflation? I think they'll say that they like the trend, that it's heading back, um, back down to their target. They're very encouraged by what they've seen so far. And because of that, they're just going to sit there and be data dependent and not do anything because they think inflation and the other major trends are moving in the right direction. That's what they'll say. Um, but there are, are many reasons to think that a lot of parts of the economy are absolutely not moving in the right direction. You know, inflation is still too high. And there are all kinds of things going on that point towards a recession in the short run. So um, the Fed's going to be reassuring, but deep down inside, to the extent that they under, understand anything, they're going to know that they're, they're kind of lying. <laughs> and, you know, there's no way around it. It's their job to lie, but <clears throat> they can't feel good about it. What about jobs? I mean, you know, so far it seems like, well, you know, they want to say that they're landing the plane without uh, a recession and... Um, we just, I mean, news today, UPS just announced they're going to be laying off 12,000 workers. That's a lot of people. When I think about UPS, I think about the trucking industry or just the supply and the movement of goods. And especially with us being such an internet based world right now, I mean, you know, everyone's shopping online. And, you know, you could say, well, Amazon drivers, you know, they have their own drivers, but. There are a lot of deliveries that are made, you know, you shop through Amazon and they are shipped through uh, UPS. I mean, what do you think we what what should we expect them to say about the job market? Um, I know they've leaked out a couple things where they say that we should expect that uh, things will soften. The job market will weaken or soften, um, you know, but what, what do you think we should really expect? Is this just the tip of the iceberg with announcements like UPS? Well, OK, starting with the Fed, you know, they're, they're not going to say anything um, extremely threatening because that's not their job. They're not supposed to do that. And so what they're going to do is talk about the job market in terms designed to make the stock market go up, because that's that's basically what they're there for. Now, um, the second point with jobs is these headline jobs numbers that come out every month. You know, once once a month, the government releases its jobs report. And it almost always has a really good number for how many jobs were added. They'll say, oh, a quarter million jobs, just like we expected, were added in this month. And the unemployment rate is now down to 3.4%, an all-time low. Okay, so they've released that. The New York Times and the Washington Post pick it up and, may, and uh, publish really favorable articles about how great the economy is. And then over the ensuing few months, 
the government comes out and revises its jobs numbers down to the point where it reaches what would be a disappointing number if it was released as a headline number, but nobody sees those revisions. So that happens every time. And uh, what also happens is that people dig around in the jobs report and then they find the truth, which is a lot less glamorous. Uh, and this last time around, the last jobs report we had was a great headline number. But when we dug into it, um, we found out that full-time jobs are shrinking and part-time jobs are soaring, which is not the sign of a healthy economy. You know, you want lots of people gainfully employed with a full-time job rather than having to cobble together three crappy 12-hour-a-week um, gigs in order to pay the rent. Uh, and the other thing that was in this last jobs report is that full-time jobs, um, uh, or, or excuse me, people with two full-time jobs are soaring, which is a really weird statistic when you think about it, because most of the time, if you have a good full-time job, you don't need to go out and get another full-time job. But that seems to be what's happening right now. Uh, and that's also uh, an indicator of stress in the economy, because in a lot of cases, it means that people aren't making ends meet with a full-time job and they have ends that have to be met you know they got to feed their kids they got to be able to drive to work they got to make the rent uh, so they go out and they get another full-time job uh, so these are signs of societal ill health you know and uh, the fed is not going to talk about this they're going to say nice things about the headline numbers and that will mostly be that so so there's only so much we can expect from the fed until they get aggressive. You know, the time will come when they're panicking because things are blowing up everywhere and they start cutting aggressively. And that's when it gets interesting because they, you know, they can't hide the fact that things are really bad and getting worse uh, and that they're responding with aggressive monetary ease. So I think that's a later in the year story when, um, when these um, um, layoffs that you were talking about become the norm. You know, right now we've got Citigroup laying off 20,000 people, UPS laying off 12,000 people, and most of the big tech companies laying off around 10,000. Uh, and that's just the beginning. You know, when that spreads to the rest of the economy, um, that's when you get people who are laid off, not spending very much money. So consumer spending goes down, retail sales drop, and that causes more people to be laid off and so on until you get this kind of death spiral, uh, which the Fed will want to lean against. You know, they will panic when they see that happening and they'll start aggressively easing. But I think it, it, well, it will be too late for the whole election year scenario. And it will probably be too late to avoid a really deep recession. So all of that is coming. And, and there are, you know, I, I don't know how much time we have, but we can go through 20 or 30 um, statistics that all point in that direction that don't get a lot of press, but they, they have historical validity. You know, when, when the yield curve does this, the year ahead economy usually does that. There's a bunch of those kinds of statistics all pointing down hard. So uh, I think there's no real way to avoid a fairly hard landing this year, which leads to an equities bear market, which leads to an even harder la landing. You know, all that's coming. So it's just a question of timing. Does it happen soon or does it happen six months from now but uh, i think you know the timing is unpredictable but the impact of the things that are happening now is pretty much baked into the cake and it won't be good well i know you know i talk to people all the time and and uh and a lot of people have two jobs just like you mentioned that aren't making ends meet and i think that's the biggest disconnect here when you look at you know in our business in the housing market um, you know, every time, every morning I get up and I'm, you know, looking at Twitter and, and, or I'm looking at the headline news and they want to talk us in and out of these things, right? I mean, they think that they can just go out and say, Hey, you know, things are looking great. looks like we're going to have a fantastic housing market. Things are going to rebound. Um, I, I'm hearing people say the bounce, uh, you know, get ready for it. I just came from a, a real estate conference in New York city. Um, you know, it was it, 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 so much cheerleading. And I, I, look, I, I agree that, you know, we want to be hopeful. And we, but I think the biggest part that people are missing here, John, is what you said and what we're talking about tonight is the debt. Because people are in debt. I mean, our, our federal government is in debt. Yes, but I mean, they went into debt helping us get into debt. And, and you know, and, and it's almost a little too late. And part of your book, I have it here, The Money Bubble, which is a great book, 
Um, and we're going to dive into that a little bit tonight. And I, guys, I don't get paid any commission for this. This is just, I, I love this book and I love John's writing and um, I love, love to talk to him. But um, I think the important thing here that we have to realize is that we have gotten ourselves into so much debt and everybody wants to say that, well, they want to rely on the, the Fed pivoting and dropping rates. Guys, if you have a $5,000 credit card balance and you've been paying next to the minimum payment every single month and you're paying 30%, 29.99% or 27.99%, if you think when the Fed drops the interest rates that that's going to help you out and you're going to get a 2.99% interest rate on your, on your uh, balance, believe me, the credit card companies are probably going to continue to charge you as much money as they're charging you right now. And I think what a lot of people don't realize is that when they dropped the rates, I mean, this is a little too late. This happened in 2007 and we had the great financial crisis shortly afterwards. So I think that we have to, you know, I talk to people every single day, right? Buyers, every people that want to buy a house that are sidelined, people that are trying to get financed and they can't uh, because their credit scores have dropped for whatever reason, debt on their, you know, on their, their consumer debt, even though they're paying it on time. So all the things that we're hearing in the headline news, that may be great for, you know, some people, but it's not the majority of the ones that I talk with, but, and we have a counter going. I mean, for you guys that are just kind of, you know, uh, logging on here w with us tonight, this counter, this, uh, you know, federal debt that we are carrying, we're going to talk about that. Um, John, it's a pretty big number, 34.14 trillion and counting. Um, you know, give us an overview. I mean, how, how did we, how bad is it? First of all, let's just talk about the, the national debt. Um, you know, it's pretty bad, huh? Well, it's existentially threatening for the financial system. You know, we're at some point, I'll, I'll get all the way to the end of the story first. You know, at some point it's going to break down and probably in the not too distant future. And then we're going to have to do what's called a monetary reset, where we basically just um, take a clean piece of paper and redesign the, uh, the system of money in the U.S. and in big parts of the world otherwise. And start over you know we've done that a bunch of times in american history and we'll have to do it again because this system is broken so um for the story of how we got here um th there are different place uh, different dates that you can use as the starting point and i think 1971 was a pretty good starting point for our purposes and that is when uh, you know prior to that we were on kind of sort of a gold standard which limited how much um, debt the government could take on, how much they could spend, et cetera. Um, but in the 1960s, we set up the Great Society social programs and, the, and started the Vietnam War. So we had these two incredibly expensive things going on. And that was screwing up the finances of the US government. So finally, in 1971, they, they broke the final link between the dollar and gold. Um, and they said it was temporary, but of course it wasn't. And, Forever, ever, forever after, um, money was just whatever the government said it was. So that it essentially handed the U.S. government and a lot of the rest of the world uh, an unlimited credit card, speaking of credit cards, uh, in the form of the monetary and printing press. And so, you know, from that day forward, we could create as much money as we wanted to to invade whoever we wanted and buy whatever constituency we needed to buy for the next election. Um, and governments being made up of humans and what we know about human nature is that you know you give somebody that kind of power and they're going to abuse it and we abused it massively so starting in the 1980s the government started borrowing huge amounts of money and they found out that there was no political cost to running a big deficit and so ever since then we've been running bigger and bigger deficits and then financing those deficits with more and more money creation and that's led to an accelerating decline in the value of the dollar. Because, you know, when there's more of something, each piece of, the, of that thing becomes less valuable. Um, and supply and demand works with currencies beautifully. So the dollar is losing value. Um, inflation now is, is starting to rise irregularly. We had a big spike in 2022. So we found out what incipient hyperinflation is like. Now it's coming back down. But... In the next cycle, so many things are going to blow up that the government is going to have to create even more currency and we'll get an even bigger spike in inflation. And that's what will break the system. So 
you know, we've reached the point where the numbers are so big that there's no fix. Like you said, $34 trillion um, in government debt. And that doesn't include all the unfunded liabilities that we have. You know, Social Security and Medicare are essentially debts that are four or five times as big as the actual official government debt. And then big banks have these things called derivatives on their balance sheets that are, I kid you not, approaching a quadrillion dollars in notional value. So you add all that up and there's there's way too much debt to ever be paid off in a normal way. And there's way too much bad debt for us to get through what's coming without this huge cascade failure of, of all the bad paper that's out there. So it's, you know, it's going to be a, a nightmare from a financial standpoint. And it's going to be terrible for the people who trusted the government and held on to dollars and government bonds and things that derive their, their value from the dollar. But it's potentially great for the people who um, invest accordingly. You know, if you see this coming um, and you understand that crises equal opportunity, there, there's an awful lot you can do to, um, to not just protect yourself, but to actually make life changing money. And so that, that's how I keep myself sane as I obsess about this stuff. You know, I, I see all the bad things that are coming and, and, you know, try hard to put the pieces together and see what the result is going to be. And the result is horrible. Uh, but then I think, okay, this is actually um, an investment thesis and it's a really good investment thesis. There's lots of things you can do to uh, to come through this in great shape. So that's what we should be focusing on. And that's that's a way to stay sane in, in a time when the world is kind of spinning out of control. Oh, why, whatever happened to balancing the budget? I mean, what, you know, <laughs> Whatever happened to that concept? Well, here's what happened in, in the 1980s. And, uh, you know, I'm generally a fan of Ronald Reagan. You know, I'm libertarian-ish, and he, he really um, walked the walk and talked the talk. But one thing he figured out was that um, you can run massive deficits and nobody cares. You don't get voted out of office. So he, his plan in the 1980s was to uh, cut taxes and, you know, have a government deficit because they cut taxes. And then um, guilt the Democrats into cutting spending because nobody wants these giant deficits. They're poisoned politically. But it turned out they weren't poisoned politically. Nobody cared. The economy grew just fine. And the fact that there was a, uh, you know, by far the biggest deficit ever in 1987 or whatever um, didn't register. And so Washington, the political class, learned the lesson that they can spend as much as they want to, borrow as much as they want to, and nobody's going to vote them out of office. So that's where the balanced budget concept went. <laughs> you know, it was it went away starting in the 1980s when they found out that they didn't have to balance the budget. So, uh, you know, imagine how nice would life would be for us if we could make money out of thin air and nobody cared. You know, they thought it was just fine that we did that. And just create debt. You know, yeah. Just keep creating debt and spend as much as you want. No consequences. Well, yeah. Although there are eventually consequences, obviously, you know, there's uh, uh, John Maynard Keynes, a famous economist, had a saying that in the long run, we're all dead. And that was a stupid thing for an economist to say, right? Because our grandchildren live in our long run. And we are now living in the long run of the people who made these decisions in the 1970s and 1980s. Uh, and so, yeah, those guys are dead. <laughs> but well, we're here and we're going to have to suffer the consequences of their horrendous mistakes. So, yeah, that's where we are. We're, we're living in the long run of some guys who made some bad decisions way back when. Well, it's like the politicians. I mean, they, they care about their term, right? So when, once their term is over, then, you know, they, they leave it to the next guy. I found a fun fact. 1837, Andrew Jackson, the seventh president of the United States, was suspicious of banks and did not trust the paper money they issued. In 1837, he liquidated the second bank of the United States, returning the government's original investment plus a profit. This resulted in a huge government surplus of funds. In 1835, the 17.9 million budget surplus was greater than the total government expenses for that year. And by January of 1835, for the first and only time, all of the government's interest-bearing debt was paid off. Congress distributed the surplus to the states, many of which were heavily in debt. 
and the Jackson administration ended with the country's almost with the country almost completely out of debt. Yeah, Andrew Jackson is the favorite president of libertarians and gold bugs because that he 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 inherited a government that had a central bank. He shut that central bank down, you know. And can you imagine anybody doing anything like that today? Well, I mean, Ron Paul would have done it. Who was uh, for people who aren't familiar with that name? He was a guy who ran. He was a congressman and he ran for president a bunch of times. And his slogan was "End the Fed," and he was awesome, you know. But he was never going to get elected in today's world. Um, so you, you reach a point where there is no political fix. Therefore, there is no politician that can save you. And we're there now because there, no matter who we um, elect right now, whether it's Biden again or Trump or um, RFK Jr., they're not going to come in and fix the finances in a government that is running deficits that um, that are this massive, you know, because to balance our budget right now means you would have to scale back everybody's living standards by a third to a half. And that's absolutely out of the question. You know, nobody, no electorate would put up with having their um, their lifestyle be cut in a half because um, the vast majority of Americans are just surviving right now. So you cut their um, cut their disposable income in half. And that means either they can't drive to work because they can't put gas in the car. They're out on the street because they can't pay the rent or their kids starve because there's no food. You know, and that's that's what a politician today would face if they tried to impose that kind of austerity um, on the country. So there's no way to fix this short of the gigantic crisis. So we gotta have the crisis. There's just no way around it. And, you know, um, the government's finances are kind of obscure, but if you think of, a, think of it as in your own life, if, uh, if your paycheck is cut in half, um, life gets incredibly hard. And uh, that's the way it would be for the country. And, you know, if somebody cut your paycheck in half, you would be mad at them and you would lash out and you would probably do something to hurt them. Uh, well, the electorate would do that to the government if they tried. So there is no fix. There is only some big crisis out there that um, that gets so bad that a monetary reset where the government gives up its power to create money out of thin air is the least bad option. And, and it is a very bad option for the government to give up that kind of power. No politician in their right mind wants to do that. And they'll only do it if the alternative is um, a French Revolution kind of situation where at least financially they, uh, they get decapitated, but maybe physically, who knows? You know, they, they, they'll wait for that point before they start actually trying to fix this. Well, you say Andrew Jackson was one of the favorite uh, presidents. Uh, he didn't trust the banks. Let's talk about banks for a minute. Um, you know, some people, I mean, look, consumers are in debt. I mean, we've, in, we've enticed consumers to, you know, I, was, I was, was talking with a real estate broker in uh, Philadelphia earlier today. <clears throat> and, you know, he, we were talking about how, you know, for our youth, it's not just the youth, but especially our youth, social media. I mean, you know, scrolling Instagram, TikTok, what have you. It's the latest outfit or the next in-trending piece of furniture and uh, the buy now, pay later and, you know, credit cards. I mean, they're offering our kids credit cards when they don't even have jobs. They're going into college and discover cards, sending a, you know, a invitation to apply for a credit card. Um, so it's teaching people, you know, hey, look, you know, go ahead, buy what you want and pay for it later. And this is nothing new. But um, I mean, when we're looking at what happened last year and when we uh, had our uh, last podcast together a couple weeks ago, we were talking about the banks. I mean, 2023 was a year of bank collapse. I mean, we haven't seen that since the great financial crisis. March 10th, Silicon Valley, Valley Bank failed. Two days later, Signature Bank failed. May 1st, First Republic failed. July 28th, uh, Heartland Tri-State Bank failed. November 3rd, Citizens Bank failed. I mean, we're talking about massive failures. The uh, Fed created this emergency fund in, I mean, like a weekend, right? They decided, I think it was like, you know, uh, $4 billion or something. That it may have been more than that, but that they sat aside basically to, you know, for the... the um, 
the BTFB to be able to keep these banks, prevent bank runs, protect people's you know uh, deposits. And we're talking about last year could have been a catastrophe, right? I mean, we were right there. I mean, we're talking about a massive collapse. More people pulled their money out of regional banks and, I mean, threw them in the too big to fail bank, Bank of America, you know, Chase, uh, Wells Fargo. Uh, we all know who these banks are. Um, but now in the news, the Fed wants to end this program. Um, and this is crazy. I mean, here an article, um, it says the Fed raises rate on emergency loan program to stop arbitrage. Some economists, John, are saying that the emergency loan program that was set up last year in March of 2023 was a free money machine for banks. Um, you know, how, you know, when we talk about the debt crisis and we talk about, you know, um, the printing of money and, um, you know, no way back, no way of balancing the budget. Are we looking at a massive bank collapse? I mean, are we on the cusp of that right now? Well, here, here's how that bank collapse that you talked about happened, and which um, will explain why another bigger one just like it is coming. Because basically what, uh, what smaller banks do, state and, and regional banks, is they, they take in money from their depositors and they lend that money out to local real estate, um, and um, local consumers, and what's left over, they put in government bonds usually. So when the government or when the Fed raised interest rates really aggressively just lately, that made the price of the bonds that these banks had had bought go down. Because when interest rates go up, the the market value of a bond goes down. So all these banks had all these um, unreported losses on their balance sheet because the value of their bonds had gone down by, I think it was like $650 billion, a very big number. Um, and the, the big fear was that these banks will have to report these bad numbers and that'll spook their depositors who will pull their money out. And then the banks will have to pay their depositors and to get that money, they'll have to sell their bonds and they'll have to actually realize those losses. And then it's over, you know, then the banking sector just implodes. Uh, so we, we got close to the beginning of that with Silicon Valley Bank. And, but another thing was they, they also had a bunch of Chinese billionaires as depositors. And the government did not want to freak out a bunch of Chinese billionaires. So they, they immediately stepped in and bailed out Silicon Valley Bank and a few other banks. And that stopped the bleeding for now. But um, those embedded losses are still on those bank balance sheets. Plus, uh, I mentioned real estate before, that might even be a bigger deal because these banks have lent money to office buildings and apartment complexes. And that part of the commercial real estate market is in big trouble right now. You know, they're uh, for various reasons. Um, those buildings are not worth what they once were. And so they're going to be sold over time or refinanced at huge losses or whatever. And they're, they're going to be losses that have to be taken somehow. And the banks are going to have to take those losses. So we'll be right back where we started, only it'll be commercial real estate next time. And the government will have to step in and do an even bigger bailout and so on, you know. Um, probably what will happen is that the, the banking trouble will happen in concert with something else, either some ge geopolitical thing or some other crisis, you know, some other sector of the economy that starts to, uh, to flake out. Because there's derivatives, like I mentioned, and, and uh, there's a huge leverage speculating community that's really long big tech stocks right now, you know, and they they would be in big trouble if tech stocks tanked. So all, all kinds of things could happen that would force the federal government to do massive multiple bank uh, bailouts um, where it's not just one thing, but it's a bunch of things they're having to bail out. And then so the numbers are going to be so big that that's where you get the currency crisis. The federal government is bailing out, let's say, five trillion dollars worth of stuff out there. And people look at that and they think, oh, that's like uh, the pandemic all over again, right? And when they have to raise the money supply by 40%. And didn't we get massive inflation in 2022? Well, I, I'm going to have to act accordingly if that's what's coming next. And so everybody starts panic buying anything that's going to go up in a recessionary environment. 
uh, and that causes the recession. In other words, it becomes a self-fulfilling, or it, it causes, I'm sorry, the inflation. It becomes a self-fulfilling prop, um, prophecy. And that leads us into the crisis. And, uh, you know, I think that's, uh, in, in some form, is kind of what we're looking at going forward, just because so many different sectors out there in the U.S. and abroad are on the verge of some kind of a crisis that governments will have to address with bailouts. So, um, you know, stuff like that is happening. It could be the banks again, or it could be somebody else that starts it off, but it really doesn't matter which domino is the first to fall because it'll knock down a lot of other dominoes. Well, how about the Fed, uh, you know, giving up that basically at par uh, lending to the banks? I mean, so they're saying that banks are taking advantage of this, uh, that, uh, you know, they've had over 15 years really since the great financial crisis to straighten themselves out. And, you know, they're still in, no, you know, and arguably speaking in worse shape today than they were <clears throat> back then. Uh, but what happens when, you know, I mean, we, we look at the reason why they encouraged banks and dropped the Fed rate in the first place was to stimulate the economy and borrowing. Uh, you know, one of the reasons why they eliminated the bank vault reserve so that the bank and for those that don't know, I mean, when you put a hundred dollars or a thousand dollars in a bank, 10 percent of that money was to go into a bank vault uh, to you know safeguard against bank runs. You want your money and you want to walk into the bank and tell them that you want to withdraw your account and close it out. Now they might not have the money to to give it to you and you might have to come back another day to get your money. If you can get it at all, depending on, you know, how many people are trying to get their money. But, you know, so they dropped the rate to zero, the Fed trading rate of where banks could borrow money to encourage them to go out and lend more money. They dropped a lot of the standards. Um, so banks, of course, were lending money like crazy. Um, businesses, it's their, their lifeline. You know, they need lines of credit to order next season's inventory. I mean, if you're in clothing, you're buying, you know, summer clothes right now to put on the shelf. So a lot of this is bankrolled, no different than a hardware store that's buying seed and fertilizers and things like that for the spring market. So a lot of these credit lines have been taken away. So what happens, John, when the Fed comes in and says, look, we're not going to offer this free money anymore, that now you're going to be basically buying it at the same discount rate uh, that's being offered, whether it's four and a half or five and a half percent, they need to make money with that. Now, I mean, isn't the, uh, the, the, the lending standard going to tighten up? Won't this spill over into all markets, the housing market for one with mortgages? I mean, what, with them doing that, is that, is this just like a, sort of like a game the Fed is playing here? Or do you think they're legitimately ending this program? Well, you know, this bailout was something that the Fed did to keep the system from imploding. Uh, and uh, banks always feast on these kinds of bailouts. They always make huge amounts of money because the government doesn't do a bailout unless it is panicked. So it goes overboard because it doesn't, you know, wants to stop the bleeding immediately. And usually that means really easy money, really cheap loans. And so the banks then just borrow as much as they can at zero, lend it out at two or three. But, you know, something interesting is happening this time. And that is that the, um, the local and state and regional banks are pretty traumatized by what they're seeing out there. So they're still tightening their loan requirements. Uh, and that means they're uh, they're only lending to really good credits right now, and they don't they don't want to hear from you if you're a you know junk level borrower or something like that. And the reason they're panicking is because they see what's happening to their existing customers. They're seeing that the commercial real estate thing that I was talking about, where um, you know clearly a lot of these office buildings don't have high enough vacancy rates to pay their the interest on their loans. And so they are going to have to be sold at like half price. Um, and credit card borrowers are starting to default at a higher and higher rate now. The, the, uh, the chart is kind of going straight up so far in 2024. And banks see that. So they see really dangerous trends evolving um, among their customers going forward. And, you know, if their customers have trouble, then the banks have trouble. So they see all that. So they're worried. 
So to the extent that they can borrow money for, ze for zero interest rates, um, they'll take it, but they're not turning around and making their usual kinds of loans. You know, I, I don't know if you've tried to buy a car lately. <laughs> um, car loans used to be um, three or four percent, and now they're they're 10, 12, 15 percent because all the banks are nervous about uh, getting paid back. Uh, and it's it's the same across the board. You know, you mentioned credit card um, interest rates going way up. I mean, they were already crazy high, like 20 percent. But, uh, you know, from 20 percent to 28 percent is still a big increase. And the reason this is happening is that the lenders are really worried. They, they see what's coming. Um, they, they really don't know how to stave it off because it's their existing customers who are having the trouble and the banks are on the hook for those customers, right? So um, they're worried and um, they're right to be worried. And if it turns out that, uh, you know, if it plays out the way that there may be best, worst case scenarios think that they should, uh, then that's, that's enough for a recession right there. You know, just commercial real estate and credit cards would be enough to cause trouble with the banks, which caused them to tighten up even further, which causes um, um, credit to be really hard to get for small businesses, which call, causes them to uh, lay people off and so on. You know, uh, you get all these um, second and third level effects from trouble in one place. And that's really what we're looking at. You know, that's that's what's coming in the next year. Again, no way to know what the first domino is, but uh, it could easily be commercial real estate or credit cards. And it could also be student debt. You know, student loans are another big deal that, uh, that that are causing a lot of trouble out there. Well, I don't think people are paying them. I don't think a lot of people are paying them. And, and uh, I don't think it's going to it get to the point where it won't even affect somebody's credit if they don't. And that's a whole nother, I mean, story in itself. You know, um, you know, going to college used to be a lot more affordable until the government stepped in and started uh, supplying all of the student loans and uh, so as soon as that was possible, because the colleges used to, f to, to fund that and people had to uh, pay a, a decent percentage of their tuition. But then the government stepped in and said, hey, we'll cover it all and, you know, and 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 uh, approve you and, and go to school. And then the universities, you know, raise their uh, tuitions, you know, staying along on the same banking trend. Then I want to take some questions. Um, Oh, geez, so much to man. I tell you, I could I could talk with to you for uh, for days, uh, John. But you know, um, Jamie Dimon certainly know uh, everybody. Uh, if you don't know who he is, uh, Google him. But um, you know, to I know you know who he is, John. But Jamie Dimon, is a big banker. Uh, you know, probably the largest bank, questionably, you know, in the world. Uh, J P Morgan Chase Chairman and CEO Jamie Dimon says the U S is speeding toward a cliff as the nation's runaway debt continues to mount, sounding the alarm that the situation needs to be tackled before it results in a crisis. You know, and what we talked about earlier today, John, um, you know, so it says uh, there was an article in Yahoo Finance, 203 trillion in derivatives held by Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, and other top banks causing an everything bubble. Um, the scale of derivatives held by major banks like J.P. Morgan Chase and company, Citibank and Goldman Sachs, amounting to the $203 trillion has raised concerns about the potential risks these positions might pose to the global economy. But at the same time, um, and they are, it looks like they're filing a lawsuit against the Fed. Um, it was not easy to find that article either, John. What can you tell us about that? It looks like um, they're positioning themselves to um, to sue the Federal Reserve. And you said that's kind of like suing themselves. But can you elaborate on that? And for those of you that don't know anything about that, it's, you know, it's like in these, the only way to find information on this is by these obscure, like, blog sites uh, but John, what can you what can you tell us about the potential of a lawsuit from these banks against the Federal Reserve? Well, the the body that governs international banking um, just completed something called the Basel Accords that uh, is is supposed to require all the big banks to raise the amount of capital that they keep on hand 
as a way of you know preventing another big banking crisis that the governments have to bail them out of. Uh, and the big U.S. banks don't like this at all. They, th they think, you know, the, the way it's being implemented is wrong and the numbers are too big and it'll interfere with their businesses. And which, of course, they think that. Right. But, uh, yeah, they're threatening a lawsuit against the Fed to keep these new capital requirements from being implemented. And, you know, here's what's funny. The big banks own the Fed. You know, the Fed is not a government agency. It's uh, basically a department of um, the big banks, you know, all, several big banks in the U.S. basically own the Fed jointly. So it's kind of funny to see um, the owners of the Fed suing the Fed. It's like, uh, you know, some, one division of a company suing another division of the company. So I think this is probably in, in the end a non-event because they'll work it out because they're all on the same team. Right. You know, they're, they're not going to let um, they're not going to let anything happen to lower the profitability of these big banks because that's how they all get paid. And I'm including the, the guys at the Fed in that too, because basically what happens at, when, when you're at the Fed, it's, it's like an extended job interview. You go there, you make government money, which is not bad, but not, you know, not multi-million dollars a year salaries. Um, and you, you prove you're a team player. You take care of the big banks. Um, you take care of the other big companies that run the world, like the pharmaceutical and the, uh, um, the arms makers and, and companies like that. And then when it's time for you to leave the Fed, they, they give you your bribe after the fact by putting you on the board of a really big company and paying you insane money or, or bringing you into work at a bank or a hedge fund in, in you know, a job that's basically a sinecure, you know, something where you show up. You don't really do much, but you get paid incredible amounts of money. So it's like delayed bribery. That's how that system works. And because of that, uh, it's almost inconceivable that the Fed would do anything to lower the profitability of the big banks, you know, because that's what, where they want to get their real paychecks in a few years. So, so I think this ends up being something that, you know, there's a reason we're not hearing about it much now, um, because it's not that big of a story to the... Um, to the people who know about this because they know that it's kind of um, kabuki theater, right? The, uh, the guys are all on the same team. So any argument that they have is more like an intercompany argument where one division head is mad at another division head or something like that. Um, and it never really affects the broader economy in any way. When we talk about a guy like Jamie Dimon, I mean, JP Morgan Chase, you know, uh, how powerful of a guy is he? in the, the political realm? Oh, um, it, it's important to understand that these big banks run the government now. So he's arguably more important than any senator and uh, in some ways is more important than the president uh, because to the extent that those big banks can cooperate, they basically control the financial system and by doing so, they control the government. So um, yeah, J Jamie, Dimon, Jamie Dimon is a big deal. <laughs> and uh, what he's doing now is really interesting because he's the one of the architects of our current financial crisis. Uh, you know, the big banks basically dictated um, American monetary policy, which led to all the debt creation and all the currency creation and you know the stuff that we've got going on now that's going to blow up on us. Um, so for him to start publicly worrying about it, and, and another thing he did was he said some nice things about Donald Trump who um, is kind of his natural enemy. But I, I think he's, first of all, he's recognizing that a crisis is coming and he wants to get out in front of it. And second of all, he recognizes that um, the, um, the political trends in the US are towards populism, which is by its nature um, antagonistic to an aristocracy, right? And so the big banks think of them as an aristocracy. And think of um, populist politicians as uh, peasants during the French Revolution storming the castle and, and uh, taking back what they believe has been stolen from them. So it didn't work to just stonewall it and you know, to brush away Trump's MAGA supporters and stuff like that. So now he looks like he's switched gears to, um, to try to co-opt them. In other words, say nice things about them. Um, talk about them as if he agrees with a lot of what they're going through and that he might actually help them, you know? And that's that's kind of self-protection on his part. 
um, because he doesn't want to be on the wrong side of a revolution if we get something really serious here. And so, uh, and, and so that's all that is. You know, it's not him changing his mind. And it might be him, you know, setting up for a presidential run at some point in the future. But if he does so, it's going to be kind of populist. He'll say words uh, that are similar to what Donald Trump says. So he's setting us up for that. Interesting. You think, well, well, that's for another time. Melissa, let's take some questions. I know that we have to have some that are piling up here. We do. We have yeah, we do. quite a few, especially right. for John. We're going to hit up the super chats first. Thank you so much, Charles. I'm fine with losing half my pay if it fixes this nonsense. Also cut Medicaid, retirement, et cetera. No more taxes. Appreciate uh, your oh. Go right ahead, John. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's... Um, I feel that way too, up to a point, although I, I wouldn't like to have my pay cut, but I'd, I'd much rather profit from what's coming, you know? Um, but uh, yeah, it, for us to fix this system without a gigantic collapse would take everybody sacrificing big time. It would take, you know, some kind of a wealth tax on the super rich and it would take everybody else paying more in taxes. And uh, it's just not something that's politically possible. So as nice as it sounds that, you know, that we actually get our financial affairs in order right away and we start behaving wisely and everything, that would be the best way for this to work out. But the, the chances of it happening that way are somewhere south of zero is just not going to happen. So um, unfortunately, you know, it's something we can um, fantasize about and speculate about, but um, uh, it's not in our future. Mm -hmm. We got another super chat here. Thank you very much. Are they doing this on purpose to usher in CBDC? It's just so hard for me to think intelligent people at the top would make so many bad decisions. Well, see, that's the question. Are these guys utter morons stumbling across, uh, uh, towards a financial cliff or are they evil geniuses um, enacting a plan that's 30 years old and has another 30 years to run and ends with us being debt slaves? to a very small aristocracy. And I don't know which of those is scarier, but there's evidence for, for both. And um, I, I'm starting to lean more towards the, the second one, that they're evil geniuses enacting a plan right now, just because so much of this stuff is, I agree, I agree. It, it can't happen by accident every single time, you know, every single public policy being this misguided and everything, it's more likely that there's there's a plan at work. And, you know, you can talk about the, the World Economic Forum and their um, you will own nothing and be happy and you're gonna eat bugs kind of thing. Um, and you can look at public policy um, every time there's a crisis and how it's always designed to make the already rich even richer. Uh, let me just take one of many examples here. Um, the financial system is basically run by the big banks and they, they basically got, got themselves deregulated back in the 1990s and ever since they've been in charge of the financial system. So what they do is they, they speculate, they take massive risks and they reap the rewards of those risks when it works. And then when it inevitably, inevitably blows up, they have the government bail them out so they get even richer. You know, after the, uh, the 2009 bailouts of the banking system, the big banks paid their bankers record bonuses. They make more, more money after almost blowing up the global financial system than they'd ever made in the past. And nothing has changed since then. So. The, the cycles get bigger, the uh, the booms are bigger, the busts are more destructive, and the bailouts are even bigger, and the bankers get richer every single time because the, uh, the government cuts interest rates um, mainly. That's the, the main response to a crisis is bailouts and interest rate cuts. And cutting interest rates makes stocks, bonds, and real estate go up because they're financeable ass assets, and if it's easier to finance them, they're more valuable. So their value goes up. And who owns those things? The rich already own most of the stocks, bonds, and real estate out there. And who does that policy hurt? It hurts regular people who are trying to save by putting money in the bank. And so the interest they get on their CDs or savings accounts or whatever goes down. It was zero for a long time there just lately. And, and that means um, 
retirees can't retire anymore because they need 6% on their CDs in order to pay the bills. And um, people who hope to retire someday can't retire because they aren't earning anything on their savings. So the rich get richer. The um, regular people, the 50% with the lowest incomes, um, are forced into debt in order to make ends meet because they can't make any interest rate on their savings. They fall further and further into debt. They become the debt slaves we're talking about. So that's the system as we know it. And there are other scams being run in geopolitics where every war enriches the already rich and in public health where the the um, the pharmaceutical companies are the ones who let's let me just say it they design some of the, these diseases um, they they make people sick and then they benefit from government rules which force people to take the medicines which might or might not cure them you know and it's that way across the board. So yeah, you know, I, I'm definitely leaning towards the um, pandemic, uh, endless war, banking system controls everything kind of point of view, where, you know, a handful of um, extremely rich, extremely powerful people are just gaming the system for their benefit and to the detriment of everybody else, with the end result that uh, we all work for them, and there's nothing we can do about it. So I think we, um, you know, there are things we can do. And that's something we should talk about tonight. You know, there's lots of lots of possibilities for standing up to that kind of a system that uh, we should all be looking at and all be implementing in our own lives. There is a question about that, John. We'll get to that in a moment. I do want to address this other um, super chat here. One of the viewers saw you on Adam Taggart's new channel. He mentioned populism, <coughs> which when allocating less. I've really been thinking about that. Populism when allocating less. Does that mean when, when we all take pay cuts and stuff or? I'm, Duke, I'm if you sure. want to be a little bit more specific on that and do a follow up comment and then we can have um, John dive into that comment a little bit more. Um, but in the meantime, I'm going to ask you this one, John. So what's the solution for families making a regular wage? Well, um, right now, there's, um, there's a really tough situation for a lot of people where wages have been pushed down. Oh, I forgot to mention globalization in the, uh, the list of scams that are being run. Basically, um, we decided back in the, uh, the 1980s and 1990s that we should have global free trade which turned out to benefit the CEOs of the companies who were able to close down their factories in the US and go to China where people made, you know, three or $4 an hour back then that broke the unions in the US, lowered everybody's wages um, to the point where um, the guys who used to be making middle-class money working in factories are now, you know, they're greeters at Walmart or whatever, they're barely making ends meet. And so it's very tough for people making what we would call regular money now, you know, $30,000, dollars $50,000 a year uh, to be able to save and to be able to uh, to build capital. But one thing you can do, you know, you sh should absolutely be trying to stay out of debt and save what you can and, um, and, and try to build capital. Although I, you know, granted, it's not easy to do. But you should also be investing yourself. You know, there's a, a thing in um, career counseling called skill stacking, but that also applies to um, to prepping for hard times. In the sense that the more things you know how to do, the better able you are to survive and thrive in hard times. Like if you can grow your own food, I mean that's a skill. And if you can grow 20 or 30 percent of your own food, you're protected against a crisis in which the uh, food supply chains get messed up. Because remember, speaking just of food, um, the billionaires of the world are buying up all the farmland. Bill Gates is now the biggest single owner of farmland in the United States, and I think maybe the world. And um, they're not doing that to protect that farmland from um, pollution or anything. They're, they're probably doing it in order to monopolize the, uh, the agricultural system at some point, raise prices, and then squeeze people even further. So uh, if you can 
you know, if you have a garden that um, supplies a big chunk of your food, you're doing great. And uh, that's one thing you should be able to do. There are all kinds of, you know, things that we think of as handyman related skills, which, uh, you know, a lot of us with our college educations and things don't don't think it's uh, that it's worthy of us to learn how to do those things. We should really learn how to do it. You know, the handyman will inherit the earth in, in what's coming. And uh, I, I think we should develop as many skills personally as we possibly can. And, and we should also, um, and, and this is just normal life at one time, but we've grown away from it, but we should be embedded in our communities. You know, you can, um, you can be as self-sufficient as, um, as you can be, but if you don't have anybody um, around who can help you in hard times, then, then you're just alone, you know, and you're very vulnerable. But if you're part of a community where you got people's back and they've got your back, um, you're in much better shape for a, um, you know, some kind of a big financial crisis that leads to uh, supply chain breaking and things like that, you know, and, and maybe civil unrest, you know, you want neighbors who you can trust in that kind of a situation. And then there's self-defense, you know, I, in the U.S. over the past 20 years, we've seen record gun sales. People are buying guns and, and ammunition like crazy, which in one sense looks like we're gearing up for civil war, and maybe we are. Uh, but in another sense, I think people realize that they need to be able to defend themselves. They can't trust the government to take care of them in that way. And that's true. You know, uh, things might all work out, but it's, it's probably a good idea to be well armed. You know, and a lot of people are kind of offended by that concept. But I think being able to protect yourself is uh, that is just basic, normal, common sense that our parents and grandparents um, took for granted and that we've drifted away from. But I think that's another thing that we should be uh, paying good attention to. And those are skills we should be stacking. And then um, on the investment side, you know, to the extent that you can acquire gold and silver, those are things that you should be investing in. So dollar cost average, a small amount each month where you, you throw, you know, a few hundred bucks if you can at silver coins or something like that and let your stack build up because there might come a time when that's money. That's very valuable money that you can use at the farmer's market or you can buy yourself a used car or whatever else you need. Uh, when the value of the dollar is falling as we head into that uh, the big financial crisis that leads to the currency reset. So precious metals as, um, as the basis of your financial life and then lots of skills, all the skills that you can develop in your personal life are, are things that you should be looking at now and that we should all be doing to the extent that we haven't already done it. John, I want to just... Uh say something in there when you're talking about um f uh gold and silver you're or you're talking about physical yes physical gold and silver coins and bars small denomination you know one ounce uh, and there are a lot of bars. you know there are a lot of people out there that say hey you buy the physical and and then you put them in these uh, storage facilities of course that are you know um controlled too right i mean but i mean where do people keep i mean do, do they keep it in their house? I mean, that, that doesn't sound safe either. I mean, where, you know, where do people store their silver and gold, number one? And number two, how, how do you even know that you're getting real silver and real gold? I mean, we get a lot of people that ask these questions. Mm -hmm. Well, um, first of all, there's kind of a hierarchy in physical precious metals. Now, some you want on hand, you know, whether it's in your house or hidden somewhere else. And that, that's a whole, you know, there, there could be a whole show done just on how you store physical gold and silver. But um, you want some that, that you own and that you can access. And um, you want to see, figuring out where to hide it is a big thing. And we can't really talk about examples here because that's telling whatever thieves are listening um, where to look, right? So, it, you know, you can go online. There's all kinds of different ideas about how to store the gold and silver that you have on hand. So you do that. And then you, you want to keep acquiring gold and silver, uh, but you don't want to store it all at home. So then you look at other things, you know, a bank safe deposit boxes. Eh, I, you could put some there, but don't, don't think that that's any kind of a guaranteed safe place. And there are other places like the Texas state government has a depository for gold. 
and I think for silver too, where uh, you can put it there and, you know, it's a reasonably trustworthy government. Um, they're set up with insurance and stuff like that. So you, uh, you're you reasonably um, assured that it's going to be there when you need it. And then geographically, you know, you can store gold and silver. We're getting into bigger money options here, but you can store gold and silver in a Swiss bank vault. And uh, that's a very doable thing to do once you start looking into it. And so then if your country is one of the countries that goes just absolutely crazy when, when it hits the fan later on, um, you've got some gold in a place that might not be going crazy. Um, so, the, you know, there's a long process of adding to physical precious metals that, uh, you know, can take you years and it can take you a ton of money to do it right. And those of us without millions and millions of dollars are more limited, but we can still do some stuff. And how you decide on who to buy gold and silver from is a, a big issue too. You need to find somebody that you can definitely trust. And um, there are a handful of gold dealers that you can find online who have excellent reputations. Check their Better Business Bureau rating and uh, look for reviews online. And, and uh, they're basically trustworthy people who uh, if you give them a wire transfer, you can be reasonably assured that your, um, your silver or your gold will show up um, and it'll show up in a timely way. Um, interesting things just happened. Costco and Walmart started selling gold and silver. So um, you can go to the walmart.com website now and buy five silver eagles or something like that and, and they will send it to you. And you can, uh, you know, Walmart is going to be buying their coins and so will Costco from the big mints that are trustworthy and uh, they're going to come prepackaged with a, you know, a label and everything. And I think that's reasonably, um, that's a reasonably trustworthy way to buy precious metals just because these big retailers um, their reputation is at stake and their reputation is worth hundreds of billions of dollars and they're not going to cheat people with fake gold and silver coins because that risks everything for them. So I, I you know, I haven't done that yet, but I'm looking into it. I want to buy some Costco gold pretty soon just because, uh, you know, I like Costco and I like gold. So no reason not to do it. All right. On the topic of the metals, we do have a super chat that just came in. John, people say the metals have too many non-physical products attached to them, which are easy to manipulate. Do you agree? Well, um, you, you want to start with physical precious metals. And then from there, once you've got all the gold and silver that you need stored as, as you uh, are comfortable with, then you can start looking at financial assets um, like stocks and um, and maybe even derivatives like options and things like that. But that might be um, that may be something that we need to spend more time on. Um, but um, if you want to buy stocks in gold miners, for instance, that is a, a kind of a financial asset that has a lot of upside because if gold and silver go up, the mining stocks will go way up and they have they've done that in the past and everything. But um, when you get into financial assets, that brings new risks with them. Like if you buy a gold mining stock, um, OK, you've got the risk of gold's price going up and down, but you've also got the risk of the management of that company doing a really bad job. And, the, you know, the gold miner itself falling into hard times, even as gold goes up. And you've also got the risk of your brokerage house. Um, having some trouble or having uh, there being there being a confiscation of financial assets by the government, like in that book, The Big Taking, that's getting a lot of press lately. Um, people are worried about that, too. So you do not want to put all of your financial life in the hands of a stockbroker or a banker. You know, I, I think it's OK to diversify into some financial assets, but I think the physical assets are the things you can count on. And the financial assets are the things where you're throwing some money at something that might quadruple or might go up 10 times. You know, that's life changing money if you get it right and you get to keep that money. Um, so I do it. I have a lot of stocks and, um, and mutual funds and things like that. But I'm increasingly nervous about them being confiscated in a crisis after reading the reviews that some very smart people wrote about the, the, the great taking. Um, 
So I'm kind of thinking of scaling back what I've got in brokerage accounts and, and bank accounts uh, and going more physical. But I, I will always have stocks and things that, uh, that can be traded. Um, just it's a question of how much you want to have of each one, you know, because when you diversify, that's an admission that the, the future is inherently unknowable. And so you want to spread your risks around so that, yes, you might lose some of what you've got, but some of it will survive. And so you end up with 70 or 80 percent, maybe, if, if you're lucky, of what you put into your financial life. And I, I don't think we can hope for much more than 70 or 80 percent. But, uh, you know, if we do well, if we invest wisely and in the end, we're left with the, the real value of 70 or 80 percent of it. Um, not bad, you know, that's, that's survivable, a survivable situation. And maybe you've got some capital to, uh, to start doing some interesting things at that point. John, you know, you talk about the stock market. I know you spent a lot of years on uh, wall street. You were, I guess, trading Euro dollars, right? Is that, is that what you were doing? That was my first real job. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, when I think of the stock market, I mean, I think of it as gambling, and uh, of course, you know, I mean, I have had stocks before and I'm no one to take advice from because, um, you know, I seem to buy all at the wrong time and sell all at the wrong time. And, and uh, uh, but I mean, I look at what stocks are trading to earnings right now, and it seems like really like a scary place to be. And uh, I mean, wh what's your opinion on the stock market? I mean, do you think do you think we're going to see all of a sudden? I mean, it's like a confidence factor, right? I mean, you think we're going to see a massive correction in the stocks and or a crash, a stock market crash? Well, stocks are are valued at a level that in the past has has led to a big stock market crash. So, you know, if valuation means anything right now, then stocks are ready for a 30 or 40 or 50 percent drop. So you want to be super careful about just buying any old stock or any old mutual fund. Now, within the stock market, which is mostly overvalued, there's pockets of undervaluation. And I would say the gold and silver miners are kind of in that category right now. If, uh, in, in fact, commodities in general, like copper and um, uranium's a outlier because it's been going up. It's not uh, wildly undervalued anymore. But, uh, you know, copper, a lot of other industrial commodities, silver, gold, platinum, palladium, they are extremely cheap historically. And the miners, the um, gold and silver miners especially, are really cheap compared to the rest of the stock market. So you could probably, you know, even if you think the stock market is overvalued, <clears throat> you could probably buy gold and silver miners as value plays in today's market, as long as you stay with really high quality. That's, uh, I've got some portfolios on, on my Substack newsletter divided in that way, you know, the, the highest quality core assets in that space where um, they're reasonably safe. And, you know, they might go down a bit if stocks go down in general, but the stocks will be still be there. You know, the companies will survive. They'll do great going forward. And uh, and they're reasonably cheap today. So if you're in a place where you want to start looking at stocks, um, you don't have to wait until the bottom of the next cycle when everything has been crushed. You can look at some of these already beaten down gold and silver miners and start nibbling at them. Because, you know, one of the things the stock market is, yes, it's very scary. Um, and it's um, in some ways manipulated, but it's also a lot of fun, you know, because you get uh, continuous feedback when you own something like, uh, you know, five or six stocks, five or six equities out there, because um, you get to look at them every day and see if they went up and down or down. And and uh, that, you know, it's um, it, when it's up, you, you get to feel smart and you get to be motivated to go out and do more, you know, and that's that's a good attitude to have about your money is you do some things that uh, give you feedback and allow you to learn and maybe um, help you feel better about your judgment going forward when you do, do a few things and they're right. And that allows you to make more good decisions going forward. But you kind of have to start at some point in order to reach the point where your, your past good decisions give you confidence to go forward. So I think it's, um, it's smart, even given all the stuff that's uh, wrong with the stock market, to buy, you know, a few shares of a few good stocks and then watch them and um, let the feedback that you get teach you so that when the time comes to throw serious money 
at things like that, if that time ever does come again, uh, that you're prepared. You know, you've done the learning and, and you're ready to make good decisions. But, you you know, you have to start in order to get to that point. Well, along the market side of things, let's talk about the housing market. I can't let you get away unless uh, we, we talk about that. You know, you wrote a book about uh, the uh, the housing market crash years before it actually took place. Um, and, um, you know, what, what do you think, where, where are we now? Um, you know, you do talk about if interest rates drop, asset backed, um, debt, uh, becomes, you know, more of a, the upside to that, you know, with, with increasing values and things like that. I mean, do you think the housing market can go any up any further? I mean, we're looking at the uh the highest uh valuation for income to uh, home price than we've i've seen post world war ii um you know i'm talking to people every day that they i mean they they can't afford to buy unless mom or dad's giving them a gift money of fifty thousand or a hundred thousand dollars they can't even think about getting in the market um what, what do you think we should expect with home prices based on what you expect the Fed to do here in the next year? Well, I think we're in an epic housing bubble, and you described it well, Todd, because house prices have gone to the point where they're unaffordable. The average American can't buy anything close to the average American house now. Uh, and it's, it, you know, household finances are only getting worse. So our ability to borrow to buy a house is not improving. Uh, it's going downhill rapidly, and it's going to continue as long as the the um, consumer debt that we talked about before um, leads to recession, which leads to people getting even poorer. You know, all that's going to happen, and uh, and that's going to make it harder for people to buy houses. Um, the reason house prices have not already tanked is because there's not very much inventory out there for a few reasons, uh, and within those reasons are the um, the next crisis, the, uh, the the big spike in inventory that's going to happen and that's going to make house prices go down. Um, and they are basically in three groups. One is the, the baby boomers. My generation bought a bunch of houses back in the 90s and, and the 2000s and the 2010s. Uh, and we rode those houses up to really high prices. So we bought pretty cheap back then. And uh, we've made a lot of paper profits on those houses. Uh, so now would normally be the time when we cash out um, and downsize. You know, if you've got a three-story McMansion and you're 72 years old and you can't go up the upstairs or down the downstairs anymore, you, you got to get out of that house, you would think. But boomers aren't selling yet. We just haven't started to do that yet. Uh, and part of the reason for that is that uh, we got our houses with really cheap mortgages back in the day. And now if we were going to sell and then buy another house, we'd have to pay this, you know, a mortgage that's two or three times as high as the one that we're in right now. So we're locked in. So boomers are not selling yet, but we will just because, you know, we're getting older. We, we, we are not going to stay in McMansions forever. And once we start selling, there will be a deluge because there's so many boomers that let a few of us start to sell and it'll ignite the rest. Then there's, um, Airbnb entrepreneurs, people who didn't just Airbnb the bedroom in their condo out, they went out and bought a bunch of houses and condos and Airbnb them out. Well, the Airbnb has turned out not to be a very good business. They're not making nearly as much money as they thought they were going to. So a lot of them, a lot of the Airbnb entrepreneurs out there are, um, are not making enough money to justify keeping their little real estate empire going. And they're going to have to sell pretty soon. They're not going to have a choice. Unlike boomers who can, you know, as long as you can put up with those stairs, you can stay in your McMansion. But these Airbnb guys have bills to pay. And if they aren't able to pay them, they're going to have to lighten up on their inventory. That's And that's a lot of inventory. That's millions of houses out there. And then the third is Wall Street. Um, Investment banks and hedge funds and private equity companies have been buying up houses all over the place, sometimes whole neighborhoods at a time, at 20% over the market price. Uh, well, they they did that into a big housing bubble. And now a lot of the houses that they bought at premium prices are, are not worth anything like that. 
uh, and rents are starting to go down. So these big Wall Street firms, uh, you know, they, they do this. They get into bubble assets then they panic and they sell and the bubble bursts. And, and, and so it could be that housing is uh, just another bubble asset for these guys that they got in. It's not going to work out for them. They're starting to realize it and then they're going to have to start selling too. So I think it's completely conceivable that in the next three years, all three of those groups start dumping their real estate on the market and house prices just tank because uh, they really have to go down by 40 percent just to be affordable again in relation to incomes so uh, you could easily see um the million dollar house that you had your eye on go down to six hundred thousand dollars or the uh, the three hundred thousand dollar little cabin go down to 120 or something like that the, these things are all possible and they've happened in the past in real estate busts. so i, I think that's coming so I think the real estate market is going to be one of those things where if you don't have to buy now and you can wait for a couple of years, you'll get some bargains that you you wouldn't have dreamed of just looking at today's world. So I, I think that's another thing that's coming. What about foreclosures? I mean, when we talk about, uh, you know, especially, you know, a lot of the mortgages that are out there right now have been recent, right? The last three years or a lot of people refinance their, uh, their homes to get the 4% or lower, uh, interest rate. And they took out the equity, uh, in their home and fixed it up or did other things, you know, and now they've, you know, they don't have the equity that, uh, they once did. What happens with that? Do we see, a you know, a continual prop up we see fha delinquencies nearing 10 percent um you know just fha alone um will we see a outbreak of foreclosures in the next year or two yeah uh, unfortunately but i think a lot of the people who bought recently um overpaid wildly for their house and if they lose their job which is coming right if we're gonna have a tough labor market um, as housing prices peak, then a lot of people are not going to be able to, to pay the mortgage that they took on two or three years ago, even though it's a nice, cheap mortgage. Um, and then the other guys I was talking about, the Airbnb guys are going to be, um, a lot of them are going to be foreclosed upon probably. So Todd, I'm, I'm guessing you feasted on foreclosures in, um, you know, 2010 and times like that, because uh, that's, that's a good time for professional investors who have access to capital, because then you can step in and you buy these houses from the banks who don't want those houses on their balance sheets or anything. And, and uh, they're, they're willing to make a good deal. So yeah, you I, could I buy think them, that time is coming. You could buy them straight from the regional banks. I mean, they, you could just, you know, you didn't even have to wait until they uh, hit the market in a lot of cases. And, and a lot, of, you know, here in Baltimore, in the county, Baltimore County, I mean, we were seeing houses that were, I mean, it's all relative back then, but you know, one hundred and fifty, hundred and sixty thousand dollars houses being sold for forty five and fifty thousand um, dollars. But I mean, they had a lot of problems. I mean, when people move out, usually by the time they finally get to the move out phase, um, and some people lived in the house for ten years before they were actually kicked out, because when the banks were imploding um, in order to foreclose, a lot of these homes had second mortgages. So they had to negotiate with the second position to get them to forgive their, you know, balance basically, or take some kind of a settlement for the, the you know, the, the, uh, the first position uh, bank. And, and then in some instances, because you had to physically have the, lo the paper loan document, I mean, and they had boxed up, I mean, companies like Countrywide, I mean, it was a disaster. You know, they couldn't even find the notes, the mortgages to even begin a foreclosure process. So that was years and upon years to, to actually find those documents to throw people out. So what happened were people were, people were living in these homes and till, they completely collapsed around them. Basically, the roof would leak, mold was growing inside, their electric was set, you know, was shut, shut off. Um, so their pipes burst and they stayed until it was unsafe to live. And then they moved out, you know, but we're starting to see, you know, in, even in some of the, the nicer, you know, more affluent communities, we're starting to see signs of distress. And, you know, and I was talking with someone that real estate broker earlier I, I had mentioned and him and I were kind of talking about what we're seeing now is clear evidence of 
people struggling to pay their mortgage payment because you can tell when that, you know you get a couple of years into this now and we're talking you know some people couldn't pay for their homes pre-pandemic and that was sort of a relief for them when they actually didn't have to pay and you know because they were struggling already but now we're starting to see it show up in hoas or ho the homeowners association are now citing these owners because you know fascia boards are rotting or you know uh chipping you know the things are, are looking bad um you know shutters may be coming loose i looked at a house the other day that's on the market you know half the shutters were falling off and sort of you know um you know makeshift pins holding them on um, and you could see a lot of this deterioration happening so it's telling me that people are really we are starting to see the distress in the communities and you know once that starts to happen I don't care what they do with interest rates. I mean, how are these people refinancing, getting out from underneath the debt, uh, you know, that they have created for themselves? Some of them, you know, financing groceries. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, it's crazy. Well, let's see if we have. I know, uh, I know, John, you can't uh, be with us, uh, you know, as long as we typically go. But we do appreciate the time that you've afforded us, Melissa. Do we have any other? Uh, let's do have try maybe a couple more questions for John. Yeah. Some specific questions for John. Question for John. Do you think the large number of those seeking asylum across the southern border causes downward pressure on wages? Oh, yeah, without a doubt. You know, because the when, when you have a, a huge number of new people coming in who basically need to feed their family and, uh, and will take that kind of wages. Um, so, yes, I mean, among many other things, having open borders is a catastrophe for a country. You know, um, one of the interesting parallel na parallels now for the U.S. is the Roman Empire, because 2,000 years ago, they looked a lot like we look today to the rest of the world. They had conquered a lot of territory. They had soldiers stationed everywhere. It was incredibly expensive. And um, they debased their currency in order to pay for their military empire, and they had a hyperinflation. But one other thing happened to them, too. There were, uh, there were wars outside their borders that sent a lot of refugees um, to the edge of the Roman Empire. And at one point, like 200,000 uh, Germanic tribesmen showed up. And the Romans said, well, you know, let's let them in. They'll be loyal soldiers and they'll be cheap labor. We'll just bring them all in. So they brought all these guys in and it didn't work out for them. The, the, the new arrivals didn't assimilate. There, there was massive civil unrest and they ended up taking over big chunks of the Roman Empire. So we kind of we're kind of looking at something like that right now where we've decided to open our borders and we're letting millions of new people coming in come in and and there might be disruptions because of that. And I, I think it'll definitely change the um, the political landscape if everybody who comes in stays, you know, that's going to change voting patterns in the US dramatically. And if they don't assimilate That'll really change the, the political system, too. So, uh, you know, I think if you're if you don't have a border, you're not really a country. And I think that's what we're learning right now. So we, we definitely want immigration, but it's got to be under a set of rules that make sense with consequences that are predictable and mostly positive. And that, we don't have that now. And that's one of our big problems, you know, along with all the other Romanes or um, Roman Empire type problems like hyperinflation and uh, and um, everlasting wars all over the world. But uh, yeah, that's a problem. We have another super chat here. Thank you, Charles. Is it true that stock intermediates, for example, Merrill Lynch owns the stocks we buy? So if they go bankrupt, does that mean we lose all our money on stocks we are supposed to be able to own? Well, yes and no. They are, uh, when you buy a stock at a brokerage house, it is in the broker's name. Now, there's a, um, a government insurance program that is supposed to protect accounts from, you know, from just evaporating on you. Like the FDIC insurance for a bank, there's a, something that's analogous for brokerage houses. But yes, you know, when, when you buy um, something through a brokerage house, that there's a case that could be made that they actually own that thing. And so that's one of the reasons why you, you don't want to put all your money into accounts out there that might be confiscated. 
Because, and you also got the bank bail-in thing where uh, if your bank gets into trouble, uh, the government might use money from your account to bail the bank out instead of um, hitting up taxpayers. Well, the same thing that happened with brokerage accounts with your stocks and bonds. So um, th there's one solution to that, which is you can get the broker to, um, to issue you a certificate that shows what kind of stock you own. Now that's that's super inconvenient. Most people don't want to do it because that means you can't buy and sell anymore. You know, once you've got the certificate, you have to physically go somewhere and and uh, cash it in, uh, and uh, that's that's more thought than most people want to put into their financial accounts because the, one of the big advantages of them is that they're super convenient. So um, I think the lesson that we should take from that is that we don't want to put all our eggs in that basket. You know, it's okay to have some stocks and bonds and definitely stay below the limit of government insurance. And then um, look at real assets for the bulk of your financial life. In other words, if you can own some farmland, that would be an awesome thing to own right now because it's, uh, it's not something that can just be inflated away um, by the government when it runs out of money. Uh, and it can produce food, which are, you know, which is something that, uh, because there's utility there, it has objective value that uh, that goes beyond just the paper value of stocks and bonds. So, and it, sorry, long-winded answer, but the, you know, it is yes, you you don't really own what is in a brokerage account, so you have to keep that in mind and be very careful about it. John, just to kind of piggyback with that thought, um, you know. Uh, Man, debt-based assets really make me nervous. You know, when you owe the bank a lot of money on your real estate, and I see so many people, they just can't afford to buy anything unless they're buying with almost a hundred percent. You know, of the you know financing a hundred percent of the house, for instance, uh, or land. In in what you just mentioned, you know, how what what type of I mean. What should people be doing? I mean, when 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 we look at you know people buying with three percent down or asking for seller contributions and things like that, I mean, how much money would you say someone should put down when before they buy a house? And maybe that adjusts the the property that they buy. Maybe they buy half of what they should buy um, in order to be able to either put down a very large chunk of money or prepay a lot of that down aggressively buy down the um you know the principal balance i mean do you do you believe that they should be in debt at a hundred percent loan to value no i think as, as a general rule of thumb if you can't afford to put down a, a nice down payment on something you shouldn't be buying the thing because um when, when you take on massive amounts of debt for instance if you borrow three percent um, or, or I'm sorry, if you put down 3% and you borrow the rest, and that's basically a financial asset that you own. And if its value goes down by 3%, then uh, you, you are, you've you lost all the money that you had in it. It no longer has any value. And if it goes down by 10%, which houses do, you know, land will fluctuate um, dramatically over time, but you can have a big paper loss there. So it, that if you have to sell it, then you take a really big loss in relation to your down payment. And if the down payment was all you could scrape up, then you've taken a really big loss in relation to your net worth, right? So, so yeah, no, I would say don't buy things without a 20% down payment. And uh, even then you might want to go higher, you know, because uh, you want the utility of the thing that you're buying. And um, with the land and with houses, yes, they might be good investments that might go up because you're, you're leveraging the investment by putting a little bit down and then hoping it goes up. But um, if you think of it instead, instead of an investment as a, uh, a thing that you use, you know, something that improves your life in the here and now, which is what a homestead would do or some farmland or a really good rental house. You know, you don't buy a rental house thinking, oh, it's going to double in value in five years. You buy it thinking, okay, it's going to generate X amount of cash flow. And um, that is going to benefit me in the moment. And if there's a capital gain, that's gravy. That's icing on the cake. But uh, you're buying it because it helps you right now. So I, I think that's a better way to look at assets that are financed. 
And, um, you know, I, I think to the extent that anybody can do it, you should definitely get a little bit of farmland or a homestead or something, because uh, that's the thing that sees you through all kinds of unforeseen trouble. All right, Melissa, any? Well, there's more. I mean, I could could continue going. Yes. I'm I'm good for a few more. All right. Okay. All right. John. Okay. Because I'm I'm going to keep on I'm going to keep on delivering them to you. You Guys, just just a you know uh, interject here. Um, John's information is in the show notes below. If you want to subscribe to his Substack. you know, I get his emails. I mean, I, I love his, his, uh, his work. And as you guys can tell, uh, he's very bright. Uh, he's a historian actually. Uh, if you check out any of his books, I, I promise you, you will enjoy them. They are a great read. Um, you could just search him on Amazon and, uh, easily find his, uh, his books. There's the money bubble there. I have it right beside me here. But, uh, anyway, again, I'm not, I'm not getting commission here. I'm just, you know, uh, I, I'm just, I'm so appreciative of John's time, and uh, and I'm like I said, I'm just enjoying his uh, his knowledge. Mm-hmm. Yep, everyone is. I'm I'm reading it in the comments. Absolutely, and I'm just going to throw this one up here, John, real quick. John nails it on every subject he covers in this absolute gem of a podcast. So we're very right. appreciative. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. That is very nice um, to hear. Absolutely. We're going to continue a little bit here with some more questions. Don't most bear markets on average recover within 19 months? John, what do you have to say about that? Yeah. Um, there, there are times when history is a really good guide to the future. And there are times when, when you're reaching an inflection point when history is not such a good guide. And I think this might be one of them because we've basically been in a um, what technicians call a credit super cycle for the last 70 some years, where um, the money supply continues to increase. And anytime there's a crisis, the Federal Reserve and the government step in with big deficit spending and lower interest rates. And that that turns a bust into a new boom. And that's happened over and over again with you know bigger booms and bigger busts um, as we took on more and more debt in each cycle. But we're reaching the point where that ends, where the governments don't have any um, tools left to turn the big bust that is coming into the next boom, because, you know, we already have insane amounts of debt out there. So to take on more debt, we're liable to get something like 2022 on steroids when prices were just going up and people were hoarding and, and you know, you couldn't buy toilet paper at, at uh Costco and you couldn't buy a car because there were no cars on the lot. You know, we, we get something like that next time, only much bigger and low interest rates won't fix it anymore. And that's when the system breaks. And so, you know, I thought the last time was the end of the system. So I'm, I don't really have credibility when it comes to saying this is the end. You know, we can't go any further. But that end is out there when there is so much debt and so much debt going wrong that the governments of the world don't have the tools left to fix it. And at that point, see, that's when all bets are off. And that's the thing that you prep for. Because if it's just a, you know, a bear market in equities and, and a two-year recession or whatever, and then we go right back into normal, you can get through that um, without, you know, changing your lifestyle much at all. Uh, but when, when people prep Um, by buying lots of gold and silver and having it on hand and owning more guns than they do now and buying farmland and stuff like that, which is kind of the the stuff that I'm talking about, this big eventuality that we want to be ready for. Um, The old tools won't fix it. And then so something much more serious will happen. The, The Great Depression lasted 10 years and only went away because we entered World War II and ramped up government spending like crazy. Um, so something like a currency reset is going to have to happen. And that's still, you know, that, that'll be a big devaluation of the dollar and a move to like a gold standard or something. But that won't fix everything. That'll just stop the bleeding. And then we have to recover for years. So what's coming next time? Instead of a, uh, a deep two-year recession that everybody remembers as something serious from 2008 to 2009, could be much more serious than that because it'll be the time when the government just couldn't fix it. And everybody realizes that uh, there's no adult supervision out there. You know, daddy's not going to come home and take care of things. And, and uh, that's going to be a lot more chaotic. 
So I think that's possibly what's coming, you know? And uh, I, I think um, that in that case, history is not a good guide. We don't necessarily want to start buying stuff as soon as the Fed starts easing um, because the Fed, you know, cutting rates by a couple of percentage points may not save us this time around. John, I love how you added to the community is so important. I mean, geez, I can't tell you how many people don't even know their neighbors. You know, I'll, uh, you know, talk to somebody who's interested in selling their house and they have no idea who lives next door even. And they've been there for 10 years. People kind of stay to themselves now. And and uh, I agree. I mean, I, I think community is a is a big part. Uh, we should know our neighbors. I mean, even I mean, it is as simple as just wanting to know the, you know, elderly woman that lives by herself, you know, just to be able to let her know that you're there if she needs help or whatever. And, um, you know, uh, so yeah, I, I love the, the suggestions. Well, you, you know, it's been, uh, the reason we're the way we are now is because life has been so easy, which is the way it works in a, a credit super cycle. You know, you can borrow money and there's lots of jobs and you can move to a new town and, and get a huge raise and stuff like that. So you don't really think in terms of, of a community of which you are um, in an inextricable part of, where um, that it's like an extended family, which is how it used to be. You know, you used to not move ten times in your life, um, and that was easy to do and easy to get away with because there was always another credit card and there was always another job somewhere else. And if that's not going to be the case, then you really want to know who's around you and you really want to be connected to them because you can do all the prepping you want to, but you're going to miss something. You know, there'll be something important that you didn't bother to put aside and, uh, or learn how to do or whatever. And, uh, but you take 20 people like that living in proximity and your, um, your strengths and weaknesses kind of, cancel each other out and so things get done and you're all okay and you'll protect each other and that's just how life used to be for all of human history and and uh, we got away from it but we kind of have to get back to it now Wait, you know they say that some things we were meant to do alone but survival isn't one of them right yeah. <laughs> <That's> right. <laughs> like like they say in the game of thrones when winter comes the lone right. wolf starves that's right. yeah that's right <laughs> We have some more super chats here. We got another one. Thanks, guys. Great stuff. Thank you for the super cash chat. Thank you super for that. Super cash chat, man. We're gonna get you. Somebody said we should get you a T-shirt about that. Did I know. You see I that think that's comment? funny. I, did. <laughs> I like that. Appreciate that. We're that's an another... inside joke, John. That's an inside. <laughs> I joke. got that. That's, yeah. a, that's, that's, that's an inside joke. Yeah. Um, but um, this is a pretty serious question, John. And what, what is your take on this? I can buy a house now. Should I or wait? That is actually a tough one because you, yeah. you could buy a house now. You're paying up for it. You would be paying more than you would be able to pay if you wait three years. On the other hand, you could buy it now and use it and then assume that the Fed is going to cut interest rates in its panic to stop the next crisis, and you'll be able to refinance for some crazy low rate and maybe make it all worthwhile. Uh, so that would be, to me, that would be the, the reason to buy a house if you're going to do it. I, I still think I would wait just because the, the numbers that we're talking about are, are wild. You know, when, when an $800,000 house goes down to $400,000, that's $400,000 you save, you know? Um, but you could rationalize it by expecting to refinance at a lower rate in the future. Um, and uh, but don't take on an, a variable rate mortgage. OK, because you don't know what's going to happen to interest rates. It could be that we get that bout of inflation and interest rates spike and then you're stuck with a 15 percent mortgage or something like that, which you don't ever want to do. So take out a 30 year mortgage. Um, bite the bullet right now, pay the 7% or whatever it is, and then hope to refinance at 3% in um, 2029 or something like that. So that's it's possible. You know, I, I still think it's better to wait, though. Yeah, you know, I had someone, uh, <clears throat> a uh, mortgage professional, actually tell me something that this was the best 
way I heard it described ever, <clears throat> ever talking about variable rates. The three, two, one buy down is the big thing right now where builders are offering this. A lot of sellers are offering it up um, so that they can still, you know, not reduce the the price of their home and, and get it sold. And by the way, a lot of the, we're already seeing a massive hit to the luxury market. I mean, the, the luxury home market is just taking a bath right now. <clears throat> but anyway, when we're talking about a variable, uh, payment let's just say because a three two one buy down is not a it's not an arm an adjustable rate mortgage is actually prepaying the interest on the loan so the seller prepays that for you to be able to you know have a lower payment for the first two years but here's the th this lender said if you are a doctor you went to college you, you're in your residency and you're making you know a fraction of what you'll make in three years that's probably the only scenario that I would say take an adjustable rate or a some type of buy down over three years where unless you really screw up royally, you're going to make three or four times your income in three years. Um, shy of that, John's right. Don't even think about doing a variable uh, you know, uh, rate mortgage because what happens is you're banking on rates going down. And I can tell you the 50-year or five-decade you know, average of home mortgages, 30 year fixed rate mortgage is somewhere around 7.7%. .7%. So we're not looking at bad 30 year mortgage rates right now. What we didn't expect is that the Fed was going to start buying mortgage backed securities, you know, during the great financial crisis and offer up these, you know, uh, low mortgage rates, which I don't ever think they'll do again. I mean, may, may we see in the fives quite possible. Uh, you know, for a short period of time, maybe to stimulate the economy, like John said, we're entering into this election cycle. Who knows? Just about anything could happen. Uh, but definitely, if you can't afford the payments, I mean, what I'm telling people is just buy, le you know, buy. If you want to buy now, just buy, le you know, less than you can afford. That way, if something does happen and the, the lower price point homes will probably be the uh, the safest bet because if you're buying something that's very affordable right now the chances are that there could be a lot more appreciation um you know potential in a downturn than if you're buying something that's in that seven eight nine hundred thousand dollar price range that market could completely collapse and like john's saying i mean we could be looking at you know i mean you could look at 30 or 40 percent price reductions in, in the uh, the upper end, the higher end market. And unless you're planning on staying in the house for 10 or 15 years, which you can't plan on that either, um, you know, it could be, a, you, you could be upside down. Back in 2006, here in Maryland, we have a lot of buyers that could not achieve the same price they purchased in 2006 until 2022. Okay, so their house price did not get back to the 2006 price until 2022. And that's not even counting the fact that they spent money over the last 10, 12, 15 years on their house, you know, putting a new roof, new heating and air systems, you know, renovating bathrooms, renovating a kitchen. So yeah, they could sell it for the 1.5 million in 22 that they paid in 2006, but they lost hundreds of thousands of dollars over the course of time, you know, just, uh, you know, keeping and maintaining that house, um, you know, up to current standards to be able to sell today. So very, I mean, it's, you know, it's like anything else we're buying in a, we're in such unchartered, uh, times with the housing market. We've never seen a spike in home prices. Like we just, you know, experienced over, you know, two year period, two and a half year period. So when we're looking at house prices that are 40, 50% more right now than they were in 2019 and 2000 going into 2020, it's your, your, you know, if, if you're banking on every penny to get into the house and you're, you know, uh, banking on two incomes to pay the mortgage payment, you may want to slow down and uh, and reconsider or buy 60% of what you think you can afford today. Yeah, well, one of the really important um, 
life lessons in finance is you want to be really leery of cyclical peaks. Because like you said, you, you, know, you can buy something at the peak of a cycle and then it don't, you won't get back to that price for a decade or more. You know, in um, 1929, there was a stock market bubble and stocks didn't, didn't get back to that point until the 1950s. So this, uh, you know, recovering after two years kind of thing, um, it, that's not the way it always works. And uh, in housing right now, I think it, it would definitely pay to wait for most people. We have another super chat. Consumer spending is down yet. Buy now, pay later. Transactions are up tremendously. Do we think the eventual negative effects of these trends will end up affecting the housing market, such as downward price pressure for sales, et cetera? Absolutely. You know, this buy now, pay later thing is, is kind of funny because um, you guys are too young to remember something called layaways. But the way it used to work. Oh, really? Okay. I remember being little in the layaway. Okay. Yeah, you the you counter. must have been. Yeah, okay. But uh, yeah, you, you could buy something and they would put it off to the side for you until you could bring back the full price. And so you didn't get the thing, but you you it was still kind of yours and you just had to come up with the money over the next few months. And now this, this buy now, pay later thing is, is like an updated version of that where you get it right away. And then you have to make some payments over the next few months. And, um, you know, as if we didn't need more ways for regular people to go deeply into debt, because they already have credit cards. And I'm not sure why they needed this, but it got really hot. It was a big deal. And um, a lot of people now, put their, they put their Christmas spending on buy now, pay later plans. And now they're into January and February. And they've got these big bills that they don't normally have. Uh, that they're not sure how to cover. So yes, that that is going to feed back into the overall economy. It's going to lead to lower house prices and fewer house sales and things like that, just to the extent that people are poorer than they would have been. So yeah, that's a real thing that didn't have to happen <laughs> and we'll, uh, we'll suffer for it going forward. Mm -hmm. Got another question for you here, John, as well. Does the federal tax deduction distort the housing market? Why give tax breaks? make a budget and stick to it. Yeah, you mean for the mortgages probably, right? The federal tax deduction on mortgage spending? Um, if, if, yeah, if that's the, the question, yes. Um, we, we have a um, public policy based on the idea that home ownership is a really good thing. So we want people to take out big mortgages to, um, to buy houses and you know, this big tax break on the mortgage payments is an incentive to do that. And yeah, I think it's anything that encourages people to borrow money is probably not a good idea. Again, going back a few generations, our parents didn't take out 30 year mortgages. They mostly um, just saved up until they had or and they borrowed money from their parents and they paid cash for a eight thousand dollar house or something like that. That was a much saner world then. And to the extent that we get back towards that, you know, we're never going to get back there. But uh, to the extent that we get back to a point where borrowing money is not this automatic thing that everybody does for everything, and that in a lot of cases you save money until you're able to buy the thing, it's a way healthier society. So, yeah, I think the, uh, the mortgage deduction contributes to um, a bad trend in our society. Well, yeah. it makes people feel like their their renters are not getting it, right? So, I mean, it makes mm -hmm. you think that, geez, you're missing out on something. And, um, you know, I mean, it's and, – and John, talking about when our parents and grandparents purchased houses, I mean, yeah, they – I mean – something else they did they were able to build homes on the homestead right so they didn't have to go through a whole lot of red tape to pop up a house on you know on uh, mom and dad's farm or mom and dad's property so before we got into all these crazy zoning laws the cost to build a house was a lot less and I mean, if you just look at like the Amish, I mean, you know, they raise raise these. They they had these barn raisings, right, where they all get together, they all come and help raise a barn. Well, I mean, they used to do the same thing in building a house. And I mean, we've just gotten so far off track over the years. And 
but I know and my parents, you know, they put down 20%. They didn't buy a house until they had 20% down. And yes, they paid a lot more uh, in interest rates. You know, they say, well, at least, you know, I mean, it's not like it was in the, you know, 70s and 80s where we had double digit, you know, uh, mortgage rates and that got up to 18%. But guess what? We kept a lot more of our money too we weren't i mean the tax brackets were nowhere near what they are right now right i mean we're spending so much money if we think of just about being you know just about tax being taxed it's not just our payroll it's tax on the fuel that you're putting into your car it's tax on everything that you buy it's you know a lot of people are living in neighborhoods without kids that are paying school taxes and i mean it's just when you add up all of the money and taxation that we're paying i mean a lot of this didn't exist you know back in our grandparents day yeah yeah houses have become financial assets which is the exact opposite of what they should be you know they should be shelter <laughs> and and other things that you use it for and you know not something where you uh, where you borrow a ton of money to buy it hoping that it will go up in in value you know my i grew up in ohio in a small town in ohio and my my family my mom and dad paid five thousand dollars for their house and they paid cash for it and that was not crazy back then that was a completely normal way to live and a much easier way to live you know when um when real estate soaks up or housing soaks up a huge amount of your income then your life is a lot harder than it really needs to be and that we, we've come to that point in part because um, uh, people buying houses um, kind of you know if you take out a 30-year mortgage you are in, in kind of a debt slave to an extent you have to work really hard for the next 30 years to pay that off and that's how they like us, you know. The the guys in charge like us to be as deeply and as deeply indebted as possible. And housing is one part of that puzzle. I think the tax deduction is just a uh, an evil tease because when you look at it, you actually if you take your you know stay in your house for the 30 years i mean you pay three times the amount for that house in interest i mean you want to think about you you have this great interest deduction big deal i mean it doesn't help you when you don't have the money right when you when, when if if you're not in the profit the tax deductions really doesn't become this phenomenal life-changing savings uh you know and but that's uh it's a little more complicated story, but um, I think it's, yeah, I mean, what we pay, when you look at your amortization schedule and you see, man, what is going towards my payment, my actual principal on my mortgage, I think the best thing that anyone can do is buy it down as fast as you can. If you're buying at a 6.5% interest rate right now and you get yourself into a situation where you're using the bank in order to buy it, you should be putting as much money as you can every single month into that principal balance because at least you're making six and a half percent on your money at that point, right? It's not, I mean, you shouldn't be looking at it as this is the minimum payment that I have to make to survive every month. You should be looking at, you know, I want to, that's the minimum payment that I want to make every month. I want to actually buy it down as fast as I can. And I think, you know, that's where we've really, you know, kind of uh, miseducated our, you know, our, our young people when they're, you know, getting themselves into debt. The idea is to get out of debt, not to get, not, not to, the banks want to keep you into debt. You should want to be debt free. Well, that's my opinion i mean there, there's tons of arguments on the back side of that i've been a real estate investor i get the you know the leveraging other people's money i get that whole thing and you know what everything is great as long as the economy is soaring along but let me tell you something you do not want that around your neck when you can't make the payment or you get your tenant in there that's not paying your bill and you and the tenant leaves and you have to put twenty thousand dollars that you don't have to get it ready to rent it again i mean i i i hear all these instagrammers these TikTokers. you know most of the people in the housing market today that are investing a, a lot of this they a lot of these people they they weren't around in the great financial crisis they have no idea what a downside you know looks like and uh, and it, it doesn't taste very good yeah well you know most people don't know how interest rates work <laughs> and and that gets them into trouble throughout their lives because 
right now, if you if you buy, say, a four hundred thousand dollar house at today's mortgage rates, you actually end up paying over a million dollars during the life of that mortgage. So you you pay more than twice the value of the house in interest. And it, it, I think the average home buyer, if you ask them how that works, they wouldn't be able to explain it. And uh, so that's a um, that's something that parents have failed with. You know, we should have really taught our kids more about finance and schools. There should be an, an entire curriculum in high school, right, of uh, personal finance, where you learn how to do your taxes, how to balance a checkbook, how to handle a credit card. You learn how interest works on a loan. And I, I think almost nobody understands that. Yeah, 100%. All right, Sorry, Melissa, let's I, take two more. We lost your um, visual, Todd. We you lost me? You. Yes, I can hear you. No, you can hear me. Yep. That must be that must be why I don't know who that is. I don't know who that Wait, is. Okay. <laughs> we can still see each other. Yeah, we can see each other. And I'm behind yeah, the okay. curtain. So that, there we yeah, go. Oh, there you are. Right. Yeah. There you are. Oh, there we go. <laughs> why did Todd leave? Could you hear what I was saying, but you just couldn't see me? Yeah. Yeah. I could yeah, we could hear you. Yes. It's like Elvis. <laughs> but you're <laughs> back now. He's left the building. Oh, gosh. So we have just um, another super chat here. If you don't have 25% equity in your home, you can't refi. People putting 3.5% down and in event prices stay flat or go down, they can't refi. And it costs money to refi, too. And you know what? Nobody explains that to them when they're taking out the original mortgage. So, yeah, I, um, I put down the biggest down payment possible. <laughs> You know, I think it's the only real, real way to approach a house. Right, Got another go. one that came in here as well. Todd, do we think there should be some sort of mandatory personal finance education prerequisite created in order for all agents in all states to practice real estate? Hmm. No, that's a good question. Oh, we wouldn't have many real estate agents if that were the case. Um, you know, I don't, you know, look. It's kind of an interesting topic because um, when you go to school to get your real estate license, they tell you that you're not supposed to do anything but find somebody a house. That's it. You're supposed to find, be the procuring cause. You should only, you know, go out and uh, find a ready, willing, and able buyer and that buys a house. And, you know, for somebody like me that's been in the construction industry for my entire career, that's kind of hard for me to do. I mean, I'm looking at houses a lot different than, than uh, most agents uh, walk through a home. Uh, but I think, you know, we should get back to the fact that it's the most, it's the largest, most single, most uh, important John has said it. It's the roof over our head uh, that we'll ever purchase, that we'll ever make in our life if we're lucky, right? I mean, that was the American dream. That's questionable right now if it is still the American dream uh, to own a home. But um, yeah, I think that there should be a lot higher standard for real estate agents entering into the business. Um, I, I could go down a whole, uh, you know, take this down a, another path. I think that um, at least the brokerage should there be held to a, a higher standard. Uh, and um, the unfortunate thing in our industry is we've we're working off of numbers. Uh, the way brokers make most brokers make money is through numbers. The National Association of Realtors and all the local boards make money on numbers so let's flood the market give everybody real estate licenses and uh you know make as much money as we can off of these people meanwhile you know uh we have one of the worst reputations out there uh but yeah i mean do i think personal finance education should start in the home um i think it should be taught in the classroom and um you know i think they even got rid of home economics right i mean i you know nobody i mean i can remember being a kid learning how to you know sew uh, how to cook um i took wood shop i took metal shop i took drafting i took you know uh auto mechanics i mean you know we had a lot of trades in schools when i was younger and a lot of people say oh here he here he goes talking about you know when he had to walk three through three feet of snow to school every day uh because they didn't have school buses but i mean we're just getting so far i think let's um, we need to start getting back to basics. I mean, it's, you know, yeah. 
Sure. Mandatory personal finance education mm -hmm. would be great for agents, but I don't think it's practical. I don't think that we should expect it. I think that people need to do more research. I mean, the great thing about YouTube, channels like ours, I mean, we're, you know, we don't have some special agenda. We're not uh, being, you know, financed by, you know, um, a company or political, you know, with a political agenda. I mean, we're just trying to bring information to people. It's free. It's available. More people need to take resource, you know, take advantage of the resources that are out there for them. Mm -hmm. Do you want to touch on the um, poll, Todd? We haven't brought that up. Oh, yet. yeah, yeah. Let's do that. Yeah. My gosh, I forgot because that's important. So one of the, you know, you've heard me talk about it a couple times tonight, the conversation that I have with a fellow real estate broker. Um, you know, we were talking about how brokerages, I went to this conference and the real estate brokers, some big CEOs, publicly traded companies, tech companies in this space, um, you know, stood up and said, you know, we are agent centric. Uh, we believe that the agents are our clients. And, you know, I think this is where the real estate industry took a wrong turn because back in the day, the clients were the buyers and sellers. That's the way I believe here at Saks Realty. I don't make the agent my client. I make the the uh, the buyer and the seller my client or the tenant or the landlord my client because that's where, you know, we got away from brand. Brand used to matter. And so when I was doing this poll, I was thinking, you know, how, you know, when you guys shop, and you go and buy a, you know, a shirt or a pair of pants or, you know, a pair of boots or a car, you know, you're probably buying brand probably matters to you. You find a brand that lasts for a long time. It wears well. You're not disappointed in it. And maybe even the brand is the restaurant that you go out to, right? You find a place where you like the food is consistent and the brand really matters to you. My question here is when shopping brand typically matters, yet most hire an agent regardless of the brand backing them. My question is, do you buy the agent or should you be buying the brokerage that is the sign that's in the yard or is somebody, you know, putting their big face on the sign in your yard and saying, you know, um, you know, I'm great. You're not your your property's not important. The you know the uh, the brokerage isn't important. The agent, look at me. I'm you know I have a picture of when I was in high school 20 years ago on my sign. I don't look anything like that now. But what do you buy? Are you buying the agent? Or are you interviewing the brand, the brokerage that stands behind the agent? So that was the question here. So um, number one here, I don't care about the brokerage. No, that says it all. It says it all. Maybe that's why you guys are having the experiences that you're having when um, you're being disappointed by the agent um, that um, you know only cares about the commission check. That that's what you say. Uh, you know, so maybe we need to put a little bit more emphasis on the company that backs the agent. Maybe we should be asking more questions about the brand. So um, there you have it. That speaks for itself. Mm -hmm. It's kind of what I expected it to be, to be honest with you. I expected it to be more that says they don't care about the brokerage. But let me tell you something. You would be surprised if you look into the brokerage, you would be surprised how much they don't care about you because they care more about the agent that you complained about instead of the customer satisfaction. So I think it's a lesson to learn. Anyway, guys, we love you, man. We appreciate you spending your Tuesday night with us. Um, you know, it enables us to get great guests like John. Uh, John, thank you so much. Oh, thanks. This was really fun. Enjoyed it. And if you guys haven't, uh, you know, checked out his last video on our channel, it was a couple Saturdays ago. Uh, he deep dives. We, you know, uh, really deep dives into a lot of uh, more macro uh, economics and um, you know what uh, we appreciate you guys thank you so much for watching Melissa
Yes, thank you so much. Thank you, John. I know you had limited time this evening and so grateful that you were with us for the whole show. Really, really appreciate that. I know that our viewers did as well. Wonderful comments. And thank you, everyone. Thank you for tuning in for another Tuesday night. Look forward to seeing you next week. All right, guys, till next time. See you soon. See you soon.